Good day, everybody, and a big warm welcome from me. I'm Estelle Levin Nally, CEO and founder of Levin Sources. And on behalf of the co hosts for this event, the New York Declaration Forests Progress Assessment and Global Platform involving Climate Focus and the Meridian Institute, I want to welcome you to our session for Forest's sake. So you may ask, what is goal three of the New York Declaration of Forests? It is to significantly reduce deforestation derived from other economic sectors by 2020. And by other, we mean not agriculture. What's going to happen today? Well, I'm going to begin by presenting to you some of the impacts of mining and its associated infrastructure on forests. I'll be followed by Aaron D. Matson, who will share with you some of the findings from the 2020 assessment of the New York Declaration of Forests Goal 3. Then I will have five esteemed panelists have a question and answer session with me. Before we will turn to some of your questions, hopefully, if you ask us them um, at the end of the session. In order to ask them, please type your questions into the chat box and a forest elf invisible to all of you will magically transfer those to me so that I can ask them to the panelists. Um, one thing I do want to point out as well is that the session will run in English and Spanish. So if you're not bilingual, you may wish to sort out the interpretation through the programme. Thank you. So Trevor, if we could turn to my first slide, please. So what are the impacts of mining and its associated infrastructure on forests? I'm gonna to touch on this subject because it's important that you as an audience understand why the New York Declaration on Forest is now turning its attention to mining and infrastructure as a target sector for committing to the achievement of the NYDF goals. But a word on scope, I'm only going to speak about large scale mining in this session because we're focused on goal three only, not on goal four, which is where artisanal and small scale mining would come in and is actually where I have the greatest expertise. So I want to emphasize two things from the outset. As you listen to my presentation, please remember that what I'm saying is not the full picture, not just in relation to only a slight mention of artisanal mining here and there because I couldn't help myself, but also because the research that I'm drawing upon did not include coal or construction materials in its scope. Two, two very important sets of minerals that do have large impacts upon forests but are understudied. Now, the research I'm going to draw upon was led by Levin Source's strategic partner in forest smart mining, Fauna and Flora International, as part of our joint programme of work, together with Swedish Geological, into forest smart mining for the World Bank in 2017 to 2019. And my colleague Pippa Howard, who led that work, is on the panel today and you'll be hearing from her. Can you go to the next slide, please, Trevor? Thank you. And this foundational research into mining's impacts on forests um, was part of the World Bank's bigger program on climate smart mining. You'll see that forest smart mining is one of 12 pillars of their climate smart mining initiative. Now, when I use the term forest smart mining, I'm referring to the opportunity for the mining sector to generate positive outcomes for forest health and forest people. Forest smart mining is mining that considers the needs of forests at the same time as the needs of mining, not privileging one over the other, as we see in so many jurisdictions. Forest smart mining means developing an approach that meets the requirements of both. If we're going to achieve goal three of the New York Declaration of Forests, we have to make forest smart mining a reality. Next slide, please, Trevor. So how much mining is actually going on in forests? Well, it's actually quite a lot. Research in 2015, well, our research in 2017, drawing on research in 2015, found that 1,539 large-scale mines were operational in forests at that time. This represents 44% of all operational mines globally. But if we consider mines that were in development or are currently non-operational, then another 1,826 mines are existing in forests. And most of these are open pit mines, which are immensely more devastating to forests typically than underground mines would be. If we use an assumed area of interest of up to 50 kilometers radius, this means that around 10% of all forests, 10% are potentially influenced by operational large scale mining projects. 
And this rises to nearly a third of all forests if the mines and development or those that are non-operational are also considered. And those numbers are growing. Next slide, please, Trevor. Now our findings showed that most mining in forests is in boreal forests in the Northern Hemisphere and in the largest countries like China, the Russian Federation, Brazil, and so on. But over half of all existing forest mining occurs in lower and middle income countries. 7% of mining is in, uh, in forests is in the tropics. And this feels like a, or this is a relatively small number, but we also found that a lot of growth in mining development is happening in the tropics. And of course, the impacts are felt more keenly in the tropics where biodiversity values are higher and where carbon sequestration potential is also higher. We found that the impact of mining on forests is higher in Asia and Africa than say in Latin America, but there are very important outliers in countries like Brazil and Venezuela. In fact, Brazil is the number one hotspot where we should be putting our attention to dealing with mining in forests. But there are other important countries and we rank them in the 2019 report and I encourage you to look at the full list but here you'll see 10 of them that span multiple continents, from Congo and Zambia to Ghana, Zimbabwe, the Philippines, China, Indonesia, and small nations like Albania also, as well as of course, Russia. We also found that few mines exist in side protected areas or key biodiversity areas, but a large number are very nearby conservation areas. In fact, research that Levin Sources led in 2010 to 2012 with the World Wildlife Fund for Nature, when we studied 150 protected areas in 37 countries, we found that artisanal mining illegally was happening in over two thirds of those. And that was 10 years ago, in which time the um, population of artisanal small scale miners has grown from about 23 million to 40 million in 10 years. Next slide, please, Trevor. So what does mining's impact on forests look like? Well, mining of all scales can have impacts from anything from undetectable degradation to very significant whole scale deforestation at a landscape level. Large scale mining is a major contributor to deforestation in some landscapes because of its large footprint. And as I said before, especially where there's open pit mines. But the biggest challenges are tailing stams failures, which we've seen on a number of occasions now in Brazil, where the world is fortunately now taking action to prevent this happening again. And also the challenges with disposal of waste. This shows us that the introduction of more innovative techniques around circularity within mining operations, for example, repurposing mine waste into new products can help limit mines impacts on forests. By contrast, artisanal and small scale mining usually has relatively minor direct impacts on forest loss. It's more through degradation, through pollution and bushmeat hunting and associated subsistence activities that artisanal mining has its impacts on forests. However, in certain geographies like Madre de Dios in Peru and Banca and Belitung that you see here in Indonesia, also Ukraine for amber mining, we see wholesale deforestation that is utterly devastating. Next slide, please. And then I think again, Trevor, I think we've got lost on the slide. Sorry, there we go, perfect. Thank you, sorry. Um, if you could go back one slide, please, I apologize. So the sum is that mining has significant and severe impact on forests. In fact, it's the fourth largest driver of deforestation. And it causes 7% of deforestation in tropical and subtropical countries. It should not be ignored. Mining impacts on forests through three different major ways. Direct impacts, like that waste that I was telling you about before. Indirect impacts, where for example, um, access roads for exploration, uh, open up frontier forests, um, allowing local communities to migrate deeper into remote places and introduce slash and burn agriculture, hunting and other natural resource-based livelihoods that degrade and may deforest forests. And the last major channel of, uh, of impacts are cumulative impacts, which are particularly complicated, the most challenging to tackle, as they involve multiple stakeholders with diverse interests and priorities. Fundamentally, political processes are needed to tackle cumulative impacts. And if we could go to this slide here, there we are, you have it. Sorry, I'm, I'm working from a different device. Um, you'll see through these cartoons, which bring a form of humor to a serious issue that 
it's quite a serious issue when we look at cumulative impacts. What this means is that where mining is happening in a multi-operator landscape, like for bauxite in Guinea or gold in Ghana, in places where there are multiple land uses like pastoralism or horticulture alongside mining, like in Brazil, or where large and small types of mining coexist in forest landscapes, the impacts on forests can be much greater. Largely because there is a view that whose responsibility is it? And because of a lack of resources and political um, um, uh, expedience, let's say, to coordinate and convene people into a collective response. Now, some mineral categories, moving to the next slide, can be identified as the priority categories for action. The top three minerals mined in forests are gold, iron and copper, with gold in particular mined in high biodiversity forests. But the industries with the highest reliance on forest mines are aluminium, zinc and nickel, all of which have over 60% of their mines in forests. Equally, there are certain sectors that have the strongest business case to um, tackle the uh, for, uh, mines impacts on forests. And you see some of them here, clean energy, technology, and jewelry and finance. Next slide, please, Trevor. So besides the type of mineral and market demand is influencing factors that can determine the extent and nature of a mine's impacts on a forest, there are a whole suite of other factors that contribute to what kind of impacts a mine will have. And you see some of these here. But in some addressing a mine's impacts requires a good understanding of the intrinsic and the contextual factors of that mine and it requires developing a risk management framework that responds to this unique set of circumstances. This complexity tells us that mining companies alone are not responsible or able to entirely manage their impacts on forests. They have to work with others to achieve goal number three. Last slide, please, Trevor. I want to, before I pass you to Erin, I want to just flag to you that Levin Sources and FFI on the 5th of November are releasing a follow-up report, um, thanks to funding from a philanthropic foundation that hopefully can provide a view into starting points for donors on what they can be doing to make forest smart mining more of a reality. So do please look out for that on the 5th of November. Trevor, thanks so much for changing the slides for me. I'd like to now introduce Erin D. Matson. Erin is a senior consultant at Climate Focus and is the coordinator of the New York Declaration of Forest Progress Assessment. She's going to talk to you about um, the findings of the assessment, but first, I think she's got a little poll for you. So over to you, Erin. Thank you so much, Estelle. Uh, I'm so happy to be here uh, with you all today to share some of the findings from our assessment of progress toward goal three of the New York Declaration on Forests. Uh, but yes, as Estelle mentioned, I do have a, a quick slide for you. So Trevor, if you could bring up my first slide and then quickly transition to the Slido slide, perfect. So uh, I'd like to ask our audience to please go to slido.com uh, and enter the code GLF Biodiversity to participate in the question and you can select the room climate focus or you can scan the QR code here on your screen from your phone. So hopefully uh, many of you are seeing the question now, which is how many kilometers of roads do you expect uh, will be built over the next three decades? And this is globally. Um, how many kilometers of roads are expected to be built over the next three decades? Trevor, I'm not sure if uh, you'll be sharing the Slido responses as they come in, but I'd like to offer everyone a few more moments to answer their, this question. Uh, how many kilometers of roads do you think are expected to be built over the next three decades? So I see a few answers coming in. Folks are thinking it's in the millions, which is uh, on the right track, on the right track. Uh, you should get the correct answer when you click, um, but I will, Go ahead and move on to my next, uh, well, I'll go ahead and let you know the answer. 
Um, I'm seeing a consensus around 12 million. So double that and you'll be right. Uh, about tw 25 million kilometers of roads are expected to be built over the next decades. This includes both inside and outside of forests, but it's still a huge number that will pose some significant environmental challenges uh, over the next uh, three decades that we need to contend with. So Trevor, please, my next slide. And thank you all so much for participating in that question. Um, I'd like to first give you an, a, a bit of a broader overview to the New York Declaration on Forests, uh, in case you're not familiar with it, uh, or as we call it, the NYDF. It was launched in 2014 and now has over 200 endorsers from national and subnational governments, indigenous peoples groups, multinational companies, NGOs, and civil society groups. So it's very multi-stakeholder. And it's organized into 10 goals uh, with the overarching game, aim of halting natural forest loss and restoring 350 million hectares of degraded land by 2030. And as Estelle has mentioned, we're focusing today on goal three, uh, the non-agricultural drivers of deforestation. Next slide, please. And our session here today is hosted again by two initiatives that work to accelerate and track progress toward the 10 goals, uh, the New York Declaration on Forest Progress Assessment, of which I'm the uh, coordinator. It's a coalition of now 28 research organizations and think tanks called the NYDF Assessment Partners, which annually conduct an assessment of global progress toward each of the 10 goals of the NYDF. These are published on forestdeclaration.org. And the next round of assessments, including this assessment of goal three, will be published in November. The second initiative is the NYDF Global Platform, which engages more directly with stakeholders uh, and endorsers of the NYDF to build collaboration towards supporting and accelerating the achievement of the NYDF goals. Next slide, please. And now on to our assessment of goal three. Uh, as Estelle emphasized mining, of course, is a very significant um, aspect of goal three, but I'd like to put a little bit more attention on infrastructure. One of the most significant themes of our report is that infrastructure is a driver of drivers of deforestation. So what does this mean? Well, first, what is infrastructure? <laughs> infrastructure includes everything from roads and highways to railways, uh, to energy infrastructure like hydropower dams, trans transmission lines, as well as ports, um, all sorts of constructed uh, objects. And when these projects are built inside forests or connecting to or through forests, they increase access to those forest areas and they attract other forms of economic uh, and activity and investment. Now, not all roads are bad. Uh, roads provide access to services for rural communities and are an important component, component of economic development. But large scale infrastructure projects uh, pose a, an especially large and unique threat to forests. And they, many of them are planned right now across forest regions. And these projects aren't necessarily meant to provide benefits to local communities. More often they're focused on exports and commodity production. Corridors like this are planned across forests like the Amazon, as you can see here on the map, as well as uh, the Congo Basin, uh, Southeast Asia, especially as we cover in our report, Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. And when you combine roads with mining and hydrocarbon concessions, then you get uh, an extra threat to forests, especially intact forests. Uh, since the year 2000, um, access infrastructure for extractive industries has driven about 12% of the deforestation of intact forest landscapes. And infrastructure is a huge industry. Um, by 2040, it is expected that 80 trillion, almost 80 trillion US dollars will be invested in infrastructure. Next slide, please. So what are people doing to achieve goal three and to mitigate the impact of these sectors? Well, we found that almost every category of actor, governments, companies, financial actors, they're aware or starting to be aware of these threats, but their efforts are only making slow progress so far. And in some cases we're moving backwards. Um, at a high level, for example, governments have 
uh, designated about 18% of global forest areas as protected areas, which is a great signal to reduce uh, the impacts of development in those forests. But this status isn't uh, a perfect protection and mining and oil and gas concessions are still uh, granted and utilized in uh, many protected areas. And in some cases we've seen uh, downgrading and downside, downsizing of protected areas uh, in recent years. On the private sector side, there are many se sector sustainability initiatives for mining and infrastructure, such as the Inter International Council on Mining and Metals or the SQL and SURE standards for infrastructure. But the uptake of these standards has been quite slow and small compared to the overall size of these sectors. And on the finance side, many financial institutions have adopted high level principles to manage social and environmental risks, like the equator principles and the principles for responsible investment. And in a good sign of progress, uh, the equator principle signatories actually do cover the majority of international project finance debt within uh, developed and emerging markets. But how these principles are applied is not very clear. Um, and a large share of the financial market still has no explicit forest or sustainability policies. And at the project level, um, most countries do regulate extractive industries and infrastructure through policies like environmental and social impact assessments. But often these policies are not strict enough and they don't account for global or uh, for cumul cumulative impacts or they may be weakly enforced. Uh, similarly, many mining companies do have biodiversity policies, but few of them report on their impacts on forests and certifications for mine sites uh, are not very widely adopted at this stage. And many financial institutions and donors have uh, adopted forest safeguards, but again, they don't disclose impacts on forests from their investments in many cases. And meanwhile, indigenous peoples, local communities, youth, they're working at the grassroots level to fight for access to decision-making spaces, often through leveraging international support, uh, taking fight to the courts um, and winning some legal battles for ter territorial protection, but losing others. And many of them are facing criminalization and violence. Just last year, there were over, there were 50 murders of environmental defenders related to the mining sector. Next slide, please. So what is holding us back? What are the barriers to progress? Why is progress slow? Uh, one of the major pieces is that transparency in these sectors is very limited. Uh, governments, companies, financial institutions, they, they don't clearly uh, disclose their decision-making processes on these issues um, or the social and environmental impacts of these investments at nearly the level that we need to build accountability for these impacts. There's also weak enforcement of even the policies and regulations that do exist. Often there's a lack of capacity or underfunding of the relevant government agencies that are meant to regulate these sectors, or there's a lack of coordination within governments. And sometimes there is corruption or undue influence of special interests that impedes uh, the effective enforcement of these policies. There's also a huge power disparity between governments, companies, and financial institutions on the one hand, and indigenous peoples, local communities, youth, and other citizens on the other. Regular citizens and communities with an interest in forests have to fight very hard to get access to decision-making spaces. And even when they do get access and, have their, and are able to use their voice, they are often ignored. And finally, there's the global demand for commodities that are produced uh, in forest areas and that infrastructure and mining and extractives uh, produce uh, is, is continues to rise. And um, the countries that consume these commodities have so far taken very few steps to limit uh, the impact of that demand through demand side measures. Next slide, please. So what can we do about these problems? How can they be addressed? Uh, well, these are great questions that I look forward to hearing uh, insights on from our panelists shortly. Um, in the meantime, next slide, please. Thank you so much uh, for your attention today. And please be on the lookout for our report, which will launch on November 19th. You can find it at forestdeclaration.org and also follow the NYDF assessment and NYDF platform Twitter accounts to stay updated. 
And so with that, I would like to thank you all again and pass it back to Estelle to transition to our panel discussion. Thank you. Erin, thank you so much. So I'm delighted to introduce all of you to our panelists. I'll, I'll mention each of them now and then we'll turn to Laura in the first instance. Um, so our panelists are Laura George, who is Advocacy and Rights Coordinator for the Amerindian People's Association. Pippa Howard, Director of Extractives and Development Infrastructure Programme at Fauna and Flora International. Diego Moreno, the Director of Environmental Control at the Ministry of Environment and Water in the Government of Ecuador. Marcela Bocchetto, the Manager of Biodiversity and Climate Change for Anglo-American in Chile. Benambra Matur, Regional Director for Asia Pacific and at Youth for Nature. So if I could turn to you first, please, Laura. Um, I don't know if your video is on, um, but I'd like to ask you, what are the main reasons indigenous peoples and local communities rights are not being upheld in the face of extractives and infrastructure development? And could you share a concrete example of the challenges you face in Guyana and how indigenous peoples and local communities there are tackling these challenges? Okay, thank you, Estelle. Uh, good morning from Guyana. And thank you for having us on this panel. Now, there are various reasons why indigenous peoples continue to face challenges in the face of um, infrastructure development and, and you know, living impacts from deforestation. Uh, one of the main reasons that we have is that there is a gap in the legal framework with regards to protection of indigenous people's rights, with regards to respecting and applying the rights of indigenous peoples to free prior and informed consent. And because in infrastructural development, a lot of land, land recognition tenure is not there in, in legal frameworks and, and therefore creates a lack of coordination as well. I think coming from uh, different government agencies. And so for example, infrastructure development through, through the lands and territories of indigenous peoples, uh, relevant agencies do not respect indigenous people's right to participate to say if they want infrastructural development to take place through the lands or where they might want to have these roads built through this. A lot of road building through the hinterland today is actually financed from mining activities. Um, it is done, uh, monitored by the mining agency. And indigenous peoples are not consulted on this infrastructure development. That is the road building, for example, through the hinterland of Guyana. So it's largely road building under the guise of connecting the hinterland and indigenous people's development to the coast. Because in Guyana, the, the, the coast is where you find about 90% of the population of Guyana. Indigenous peoples live majorly in the hinterland, in the forested highlands and where we have our waters and all of that. Um, whilst there are Whilst there are government policies regard, with regards to forest protection, Guyana has a very international record, a very good international record of um, having policies and strategies to, to protect the forests. However, the lack of inclusion, effective participation of indigenous peoples in the design, implementation and monitoring of such policies and programs is what is causing um, as I said, a lack of the right to respect ethic, the lack to respect ethic is what is causing all of these uh, deficiencies and challenges. Um, and can I give a concrete example? Guyana is listed as, Guyana is going to be one of the quickest uh, or the quicker developing countries because of our oil fine and oil extraction that is going to be taking place on the, in the ocean, not in the forest. 
But what is going to happen is that financing from this extraction is going to contribute to an increased, uh, a very advanced increased deforestation because you know it will be supporting development and, uh, and other all factors of development in Guyana. It said that we will have a very a, a large GDP. Our population is 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 not is just under a million. We're not even a million people here in Guyana. Um, so if our safeguards and our legal frameworks and participation of civil society is not going to be enhanced and coordinated, there is going to be a huge move for private sector, um, for private sector engagement and development to the hinterland. And it is very, it is very, um, it is very alarming. So what do we do in Guyana? So as an organization, our, our Amerindian People's Association have been supporting the formal organizing of indigenous peoples, the communities that is, so that they can speak to, you know, they can speak as a collective. They can be recognized as a collective by the government, by um, NGOs, by private sector, that this is a people or groups of peoples that, that they need to speak with. Um, in, in whatever development the, or, or what we term development. Um, so that is one way of doing it. We have been working to support communities to enhance um, or to, to begin on and enhance wherever there is monitoring of our lands, um, where there is mining taking place. Uh, we have been trying to well, we largely participate as an advocate for the rights of indigenous peoples in policy development, legislative um, reform. And so this is where we also reach out to communities. And as I said, impressing on the collective that indigenous people's rights are collective rights. Indigenous people's issues impact us on a collective and therefore representation must be done as a collective. And that is the work that we have been doing that we do with communities. And it's very critical at this time, as I said, now with the pandemic, with a government uh, listing mining as an essential service while there is uh, limited uh, enforcement and monitoring for best practices, it's, 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 very, it's even more alarming as well. Um, I don't know how much more time I have, but um, we have, uh, for example, um, our legal system really needs to be responsive to indigenous people's rights. Where we have approached the courts for legal protection, legal recognition of our, of our territories. I come from a people that, that have a court, a, a case in court, and it's over 22 years that we are awaiting judgment. And that would be just the first stage of awaiting a high court judgment from our country. In the meantime, um, there is active mining going. Indigenous peoples today uh, are sadly and alarmingly getting into mining, they have invested in mining. So some of the things that we have been pushing for is um, alternative to mining, promoting uh, indigenous people's um, knowledge and for access to mining for alternatives. And so one of the things that indigenous peoples that we know that in information they need to have is how do they get together as a collective as well to access direct financing where they are, where it is possible for them to do so. Right, so those are some of the things that we do in Guyana and our challenge, as I said, is infrastructure development, forest, forest, forest laws do not protect and recognize indigenous people's land rights on our territories. Yes. Laura, thank you. The, the thing I found most interesting there before I move on to Pippa is how the indirect impacts of the oil sector's development is likely to be the destruction of forests through infrastructure development yeah. because of this new wealth. And there's yes. a possibility there of that extractive sector to support indigenous peoples to have voice and build your capacity to, to have um, 
your rights respected and, and your, your voice is heard in, in decisions around those, that infrastructure. Thank you very much. Um, I need to move to Pippa in the interest of time, but I would love to speak to you for the rest of the session on this, because I think there's a lot to unpack. Hopefully we'll get some questions from the audience that respond to this. Um, Pippa, <coughs> if I could turn to you, please. Christelle, thank you. Yes, and a very powerful um, um, you know, presentation before by Laura. Thank you so much. I mean, we all recognize that mining has a, a potentially important role um, and, and some of the, uh, the infrastructure that goes alongside all these sorts of developments too, to play in the delivery of the sustainable development goals and the transition to a low carbon economy. But to achieve this, the sector has to address its harmful environmental and social impacts, including the contributions to greenhouse gases, and impacts on biodiversity in local communities. Now the transparency and accountability movements need to call to action and they need to ask for details on operational uh, performance and applications of the environmental and social safeguards at both site and the landscape scale. We have to get beyond the gloss of corporate policy and promise to action on the ground. I have three main points of these. The companies and their lenders need to demonstrate their understanding of their risks, these ESG risks, at an operational level. And for this to be forest smart, we need to be um, asking about how companies are operating in these forest environments. They need to pr proactively engage with stakeholders, taking into account the reality of the complexity in most operating contexts. We've just heard from Laura how complex this can be. And nature-based solutions need to form a fundamental part of operational solutions and need to be part of a suite of both climate change mitigation, carbon offsets, and the delivery of positive social biodiversity and water objectives. So this is the kind of information we need to come from companies and their lenders. Although 77% of companies have a clear board responsibility for climate policy, less than 8% of companies have aligned their um, stated policy positions with their lobbying activities. And in relation to climate action, Although 70% of companies have long-term greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, only one fifth of these companies are actually adhering to science-based targets. And only 9% of them are, for, are, are falling within these two degree target scenarios. As you mentioned, Estelle, um, we worked on the delivery of a report from by the World Bank and, and, and ProFord um, to explore the uh, impacts of large scale mining. And the report did paint a very stark picture Mining in forests is a significant and rising issue. And as Erin's pointed out, so is all the infrastructure that goes alongside it. So I'm gonna focus a little bit on, on, on this um, element. Forest Smart is more than minimizing harm. It demands a more dynamic, integrated understanding of the relationship between forests and economic activities and the, the identification of synergies that help to drive positive forest outcomes. Forest Smart mining and infrastructure therefore requires an understanding of the ecology of the forest landscapes and all the impacts um, and dependencies that you've spoken to earlier. It requires an understanding of all the actors across the landscape, the interactions between them. It requires not only the avoidance and minimization of negative impacts, but also the active pursuit of opportunities to ge generate positive impacts. And this has to be part of disclosure. The socioeconomic contexts are also strongly, um, they strongly influence the scale and severity of these kind of impacts um, from mining and infrastructure development. And whilst a sound understanding of the socioeconomic and cultural aspects can help um, operators design um, locally appropriate mitigation, we're not doing that clearly and well enough. So the transparency accountability movement therefore needs to call for forest smart development frameworks that are multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder, multi-impact, and this can help to develop common goals for sustainability and forest protection. And they can enable the early identification of potential conflicts, the risks and trade-offs, and promote the um, engagement of various stakeholders for much, much greater efficiency in policy planning and implementation. This is particularly important in landscapes where mining may not be the primary driver of deforestation or forest degradation. And we talk about all those secondary things that are going on that have to be understood and brought into the equation. So policy coherence, as Laura was saying, interministerial coordination and transparency over land use and development decision-making will be needed. Um, landscape planning processes also have to be part of this, uh, this, this, this picture and they must follow best practice for transparent, inclusive and meaningful stakeholder engagement. And finally, 
forest smart uh, or forest management and protection needs to be integrated into sustainable development policies, including strategies focused on poverty alleviation, climate resilience, and the sustainable management of water and natural resources. And that includes very, very centrally biodiversity, but also how we can use those landscapes efficiently, but without compromising the integrity of those forests for agriculture and mineral exploitation. Thanks, Estelle. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move um, straight to Diego Moreno. Diego. Um, and I would ask people to make sure they're on the um, correct channel if they don't speak Spanish, please. Um, Diego, Ecuador is working to stop the use of mercury in the artisanal mining sector. Could you please share more about this and what is the role of regulatory action and policy design in relation to responsible mining to reduce the impacts of mining on forests? Hola, buenos días. Buenos días. Espero que se me escuche bien. Eh, les saludo eh, Diego Moreno, director de Normativa y Control Ambiental en el Ministerio del Ambiente y Agua de Ecuador. Eh, sí, muchísimas gracias, Estel, por la, por, por la pregunta. Y en realidad, para el Ministerio del Ambiente y Agua es, eh, es un verdadero reto el poder abordar tantos, eh, tantos aspectos dentro de todo lo que tiene que ver con la con la minería y, por otro lado, la conservación de los bosques. Como ustedes conocen, el Ecuador es uno de los países con mayor diversidad biológica en el mundo. En lo que tiene que ver con eh, genética como con eh, especies y ecosistemas. Es pues una gran variedad de, de microclimas y de bosques. Y con esas consideraciones, eh, la regulación nacional que tenemos en Ecuador en debe afrontar todos estos, estos retos. Uno de ellos y uno de esos cuerpos normativos que más eh, fortaleza le dan a todo el accionar de lo que tiene que ver con la minería y la conservación de bosques es el hecho de que en nuestra Constitución se le otorgan derechos, es decir, a la naturaleza, es decir, la naturaleza es sujeto de derechos como una persona natural, como una persona jurídica, y eso exige la construcción de normativas, eh, de leyes, de regulaciones de especiales que den cumplimiento a ese principio constitucional. Ahora, lo que tiene que ver de manera específica con, el, eh, con, la, con la normatividad eh, nacional, tenemos algunas otras fortalezas que pretenden eh, empatar los dos principios, es decir, un desarrollo de la minería eh, sustentable y por otro lado la conservación de los bosques. Sin embargo, eh, uno de los retos más, más importantes que tenemos en este sentido es el de enfrentar la minería artesanal ilegal. Como ustedes sabrán, o, o, o los, les doy un pequeño contexto, tenemos vastas zonas de, dentro de, de nuestras áreas, de nuestros bosques amazónicos, nuestros bosques costeros, o incluso en bosques eh, alto andinos, que tienen eh, actividades mineras ilegales que, como su concepción misma, eh, por ser ilegales, eh, reúnen a, un, a muchísimas otros, otros cometimientos de ilegalidades, tales como eh, tráfico de drogas, tráfico de armas, lavado de activos, y todo este tipo de, todo este tipo de, de, de ilícitos se reúnen alrededor de la minería ilegal, y eh, esta minería ilegal ya desde el punto de vista ambiental eh, incurre en una serie de incumplimientos, en una serie de, de agresiones al ambiente, eh, y uno de los más importantes, aparte del, de la contaminación de las aguas, es la deforestación. Esta deforestación que se hace de una manera eh, agresiva, sin ningún control, sin ninguna consideración ambiental, nos plantean estos retos de lo, a, lo que me, a lo que hago referencia. Hay, eh, hay esfuerzos gubernamentales vastos respecto a esto, eh, de hecho, les puedo comentar que el, el Ministerio del Ambiente y Agua forma parte de un comité nacional con otros ministerios con los que hace eh, operativos que pretenden frenar el avance, por un lado, de la, de la minería ilegal y por otro lado, de lo que tiene que ver con el Ministerio del Ambiente, es buscar la remediación de esas zonas, porque como ustedes comprenderán, no solamente conlleva a, una, a, una de, a actividades de deforestación, sino también a, al uso de mercurio, por ejemplo, 
a la, al vertido de, de sólidos suspendidos, a los, a los cuerpos hídricos, entre otros muchos. Entonces, todo esto, eh, todo esto se configura en un gran reto para el Estado ecuatoriano para poder solventar, el, por un lado, las, las, las ilegalidades netamente administrativas, sino también las ambientales, que son las, las principales y una de las, eh, de las más preocupantes. Esto, esta ilegalidad también conlleva a una, a una, a una agresividad respecto a la, al, eh, a, la, a la inserción dentro de territorios indígenas. Así decía eh, eh, Laura en la, en la intervención anterior, que eh, hay varias, des, eh, varias cosas que, que, que considerar dentro de lo que tiene que ver con el, con el tratamiento de los territorios ancestrales, de los territorios indígenas, y uno de ellos es este para Ecuador. El abordar de una manera eh, correcta, de una manera, eh, de una manera legal, de una manera técnica, abordar este problema de la, de la inserción en territorios indígenas. Y dentro de los, dentro de los esfuerzos que hemos hecho para, para la, el combate a esta de la minería ilegal y de la, la consiguiente deforestación, ha sido hacer algunas, algunos balances de qué es lo que está pasando con el mercado de, de minerales, que es, bueno, en este caso de la minería ilegal, es en su mayoría aluvial, es minería de oro, y eh, dentro de eso podemos, podemos considerar, haciendo un, un, un balance global, eh, se, ha, se ha identificado que el, el oro, eh, lo que tiene que ver con la minería artesanal y de pequeña escala, produce más o menos el 85% del oro que, que exporta Ecuador. Eso traducido a dinero es, es alrededor de 300 millones de dólares de ingresos anuales. Eh, sin embargo, a pesar de que es, un, de que es un, un mercado considerable dentro de lo que tiene que ver de la, de la actividad artesanal como es, eh, la mayoría de estas personas tienen poco acceso, a, por ejemplo, a fuentes de financiamiento. Eh, hay eh, deficiencias desde el punto de vista tecnológico porque no tienen acceso a, a tecnología limpia que les permita, por ejemplo, prescindir del uso del mercurio. Eh, aún cuando, y, y tratando, abordando un poco el tema del mercurio, aún cuando el Ecuador ya eh, planteó la prohibición de su uso desde el 2015, lo cual conlleva lógicamente a, a, a muchos, otros, muchos otros problemas, eh, y haciendo un balance y, y, y en, el, en las eh, interacciones que hemos tenido y, el, y, el, y un pro, uno de los proyectos emblemáticos que tenemos con el, con el PNUD, eh, eh, que es el Programa Nacional para la Acción Ambientalmente Adecuada de Sustancias Químicas en su ciclo de vida. Disculpen, es, es un poco largo el, el, el título del el nombre del proyecto. Sin embargo, es uno de nuestros proyectos de emblema con los que hemos podido atacar este, esta problemática social del, del, de la minería informal, de la minería ilegal, y que eh, en, en balances generales se considera que este, estas deficiencias, tanto para las para el ambiente como para la salud de las personas, eh, estaría abordando alrededor de 80 millones de, año, eh, millones de dólares al año. Perdón. Y eh, dentro de todo esto, dentro de todo este, este gran escenario, eh, se han focalizado ciertos esfuerzos con el programa al que les hago mención que tenemos con el, con el PNUD. Eh, dentro de eso eh, hay dos, dos eh, escenarios principales. En el primero se busca identificar el, cuál es la promoción o, o tratar de promocionar prácticas sociales eh, y ambientales responsables. Es decir, empoderar a los mineros artesanales eh, para que hagan esa migración de la le legalidad a la ilegalidad con consideraciones técnicas ambientales. Y lógicamente, como les digo, uno de los principales eh, enfoques que tenemos es en la, evitar el avance de la, de la deforestación en el país eh, realizado por actividades mineras. Eh, otro de los enfoques es, eh, y, y este empoderamiento del que hablo, eh, es, eh, está enfocado a hacer que el mercado que, esta, que gira alrededor de la actividad minera artesanal sea atractivo y para dentro de la legalidad, lo, lógicamente, pero que sea atractivo, que sean sujetos de crédito estas personas, que reciban capacitaciones. Y dentro de eso, eh, están, eh, con el programa eh, del que les menciono, que estamos trabajando con el PNUD, Ahí eh, estamos tratando de hacer una, esta alianza y, 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 y tratar de que las ventas promedio para estas, de, de, esta, de esta producción de oro y, y el apoyo que vamos a tener también a plantas de beneficio en un, en un, eh, 
un panorama de unos 10 años, llegarían a ser superiores a los 4 millones de dólares. Eh, esto, con, esto, con la aplicación de este modelo estaríamos reduciendo en ciertas estimaciones eh, de un 80% del uso de mercurio en estas actividades mineras. Y lógicamente el, el, el impacto sobre el ambiente es muchísimo mayor y, y podríamos considerar de alrededor en este horizonte de 10 años que les menciono una, una, una reducción o una disminución en el impacto sobre el ambiente y la salud de las personas de unos 80 millones de dólares también. Disculpa, um, Diego, debemos terminar, por favor, lo siento. Ok, solamente eso y, y, y como les digo, el, el enfoque del Ecuador es a mejorar por un lado la salud de las personas, de los mineros artesanales y por otro lado el, el ambiente que también es, es, es uno de los factores importantes como les mencioné. Gracias. Thank you. I'm sorry to cut you short. Um, you painted such a vivid picture of the diversity of challenges you're facing and the efforts the government is making to tackle um, illegal art, um, mining in Ecuador. Um, I'd love to speak to you more about the complexion of the diversity um, of that mining and think it through with you. If I could turn to Marcela, who is going to speak about a very different scale of mining in Latin America. Um, Marcela, please, what is the mining sector at large already doing to support the prevention of deforestation? And what do miners need from other stakeholders like markets, investors or governments um, to do more and to do better here? Um, and can you share some experiences from Anglo-American um, as to you know, the barriers you face to becoming forest smart? Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you very much for your invitation. I'm very glad to tell you what we are doing at Anglo American. I'm I am based in Santiago, Chile. I work for the Copper Business Unit. Most of you may know that um, Chile is the main producer of copper. Um, as Anglo American, we have a new sustainability strategy that we call a sustainable mining plan from the last two years. And one of the stretch goals we have is to be um, or to achieve uh, a net positive impact on biodiversity by 2030. That means that all the, the business units and the mining operations around the world have a challenge to achieve that goal. Um, since many years ago, we have our own biodiversity standards that are required to implement the mitigation hierarchy. That means that uh, from the, the design of a mining project, we have to avoid impacts on biodiversity and other natural resources. And, and then, or if we can't avoid it, then mitigate or compensate uh, the impact we have on it. Now with the new standard, we have to deliver a net positive impact. That means more of what we have to compensate because of national regulations. And I would like to tell you about the, our new development in Chile. We have an operation called Los Bronces that is an old mine, open pit, uh, located in the metropolitan region of Santiago. Um, you may be familiar that we are located in the Mediterranean ecosystem um, and we have some forest on, on threat and also that they are not uh, protected by any, uh, let's say, they are not very well represented in the protected areas in the country. So our new development, it's an underground mine we decided to go underground because all the, the deposit, it is located beneath a protected area. So the, the new technologies allow us to go underground mine in, in certain areas. And so um, besides that, we are working in the, in the sustainable um, management plan for this protected area. We had um, a long stakeholder engagement with our neighbors and other landowners. And right now we are implementing or starting to implement 
uh, measures to improve the quality of the ecosystems in this protected area. Um, we have an alliance with an international NGO. Uh, we have the support of, of Flora and Fauna International to develop our uh, biodiversity action plans to achieve the net positive impact. And also we work with the Wildlife Conservation Society in this new uh, biodiversity stewardship in the protected areas around Los Bronces. Now, what we need? Well, um, we have learned uh, from this experience that we need to um, sensibilize or educate other uh, landowners in protected areas when there is a lot of uh, cattle grazing um, and that, that produce a, a, a big impact. So if people don't understand the benefits of um, ecosystems um, services, then you, you can't have you know, all the engagement uh, to protect uh, biodiversity. And also in Chile, I would say that we would like to have more um, regulations on economic mechanism for conservation of biodiversity. The private protected areas are not, um, let's say, well, um, well regulated. We are uh, expecting to have a new law on biodiversity conservation and see what um, economic incentives we have for, for land conservation. Yep. Marcella, thank you so much. Um, so Vinamra, if I can move to you next, please. Um, could you please tell us how are extractive industries and infrastructure development impacting forests and communities in Asia Pacific? Um, and what is the role of youth? I used to be one, I'm not now. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what is the role of youth in advocating for and calling attention to this issue? Of course, so let's say Asia Pacific in general kind of holds 60% of the youth of uh, the world right now. So I think it's very relevant for you to play a role within these dialogues and we're so glad to be here representing Youth for Nature uh, as the Asia Pacific Regional Director. I think in context with Asia Pacific it's a particular ch challenge to know that people in Asia Pacific are trying to conserve nature, create jobs and achieve development goals all at the same time and these challenges are often seen as to be in conflict with one another. And I think while it's easy to condemn deforestation, the Asia Pacific region is in unique in a way where infrastructure development is still crucial for improving lives in a lot of ways, such as uh, access, I think Aaron mentioned these, access to transformation, water, sanitation, schools, hospital, amongst other within these forested landscapes. So many countries in this region still require major infrastructure development and it will be the role of youth I think to first improve institutional arrangements between communities and governments, and then to innovate to rapid development progress with minimum environmental impact. And talking about the role of extractive industries, I think we need to see it through a socioeconomic lens, and especially in forested areas within Asia Pacific, as these areas are biodiversity rich, but the people who live within them are socioeconomically poor. So in most cases, the development can be seen as a double-edged sword in which neither biodiversity nor social issues are addressed. So in that sense, I think it's quite relevant that youth has to be involved in these decision-making processes. And however, infrastructure is still essential for national development, it simply lacks innovation and accountability, uh, which will be an important role for the youth um, to play in these uh, dialogues. And countries currently, I think, are moving forward without hearing the voices of the youth. Um, and especially us at Youth for Nature kind of do believe in advocacy and working in this climate nexus where climate and biodiversity are both very relevant moving into the future and kind of highlighting the role of youth in fostering responsible development 
and investing in emerging disciplines. You can talk about uh, ecological innovation. You can talk about um, kind of industrial uh, kind of innovation as well. So I think youth has an important role to play. And I think speaking from my background, I. I'm currently doing my PhD within socio like socio-ecological landscapes of Borneo and working on ecosystem uh, assessments. And you talk about cumulative impacts a lot. And I think that's kind of where you need to understand that um, not all roads are bad. These roads are opening up a lot of um, uh, forested landscapes where people didn't have access to um, kind of electricity. And um, now out migration is a huge issue. So these youth have to kind of stay back and kind of uh, give back to these communities in some way as well. So I think that's pretty much where I would say that youth is very important and Asia Pacific as a region is quite relevant to biodiversity and conservation. Thank you. Gemma, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to um, transition us to the the next Slido question, please. And then we have a number. I was just um, getting some questions there from the audience. Thank you to all of you who've already submitted your questions. Please, others, keep them coming because we're about to transition to the Q&A session. Um, but first, we have another poll for you. Could you go to slido.com again um, or use the QR code here? Um, and enter the event code GLF Biodiversity that you will see here and select the room climate focus. And then we have another question for you. So what do you think is the most important step to addressing deforestation from extractive industries and infrastructure? Is it securing and respecting indigenous people's rights? Is it adopting and implementing stronger government policies, regulations and coordination? Is it increasing private sector action and transparency? Is it engaging civil society, youth, and indigenous peoples in decision-making processes, or is it shifting financial flows towards investments that support forest protection? And um, this is an open question. There's no wrong answer. In fact, I think they're all right answers. <laughs> it will depend upon your position and which geography you're in. Um, but we're very curious to see what, what people think the gap, the biggest need sits. So I'm going to just let this flow for a short moment. Looks like we've got about five answers now, maybe a few more people could have a go, but there seems to be quite a resounding top choice so far. Oh, new one entering. Yeah, I'm moving up. Yeah, so it looks like we have um, a preference for adopting and implementing stronger government policies, regulations and coordination. Um, but in close second is engaging civil society, youth and indigenous peoples processes now equal with shifting financial flows. There you go. We'll see where we end up with this at the end. Um, but if I can move on now to the panelists and ask all of you to put on your videos, because I have a number of questions um, from the audience. Um, which I'd like to pose to you. I think if I um, could go to um, Marcella first, please, as a question for you on this new underground mine, um, which is that it's accessing ore from beneath a protected area, but where are the tailings going to be deposited? And I think this relates to a second question. Um, maybe it doesn't. Um, but the second question is, how can a shift from linear to circular economy play a role in reducing um, the impacts of mining and extraction? So Marcel, if I can ask you to consider those first and maybe others want to chip in on the concept of circularity after. Of, oh, of course. Well, the, um, we don't need an extra tailing dam because this is only a replacement of mineral. We, it, it is like the the continuity of the mine. This is not an expansion. It's just that we move from one area to another one. So there is no increase in the tailing dam. Now, 
that is a very good question because in the past, when we built that tailing dam, um, there were some forests in the area that we had to intervene to affect. And so there is a, um, a very uh, complex and a uh, large scale reforestation plan to compensate um, you know, the, the, um, the deforestation we had to do to install the tailing dam. Um, one of those, uh, well, and we have a reforestation plan and also we created a botanical garden with the um, native species that uh, are in the, in the metropolitan region. Now, regarding circular economy on, or how to reduce our waste, well, um, there are uh, several initiatives in the company. Um, of course, uh, the tailings, it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, it's huge uh, waste. And, and there are some uh, studies to um, basically to, uh, to change the technology in the process. So we can, we can have a, a dry um, tailing. Um, instead of, uh, of liquid that we have now, you know, and that's why we need the dam. But the other initiatives are more related to the, way, the, the other waste, um, like tires from the, from the trucks um, that are reutilized, and, uh, and also water. In water, we reutilize the water from the process that goes down to the tailing dam and then we uh, pump it up again to the process. So we recirculate like almost 80% of the water we use in the process. Yep. Thank you, Marcella. And I know that you've just brought into your team at corporate level, somebody that will be working on um, carbon neutrality um, for De Beers. Um, so it looks like Anglo-American is really trying to lead um, on issues of circularity. Marcel, no, I'm conscious oh, sorry, no, I, I just wanted to mention that we have our goal in climate change to become carbon neutral by 2040. All the operations around the world. That's a wonderful goal. I wish more companies would follow suit. Thank you for that leadership. Um, thank you so much, Marcella. I'm going to um, move on. We've got lots of questions coming in now. I'd like to ask um, Vinamra and Laura to consider um, this question. Um, knowing the climate change threat and biodiversity loss we are having, how can mining be allowed in forests? Um, this is not consistent with what we are asking agribusiness, that is to commit to zero deforestation. Can mining in forests commit to zero deforestation? What are your opinions, Benamra and Laura, please? I'm sure Pippa would have something to say too, but <laughs> I'll let Benamra and Laura go first. Oh, okay. Um, can mining and deforestation? The world has been pushing for sustainable mining, and I am not sure what, or best practice mining. I'm not sure, I come from a mining region. I've seen the destruction that mining did all, you know, most of my, all of my life. Um, therefore, in as much as we might want to have the grand ideas to, have mining continued with best practice and no deforestation and low deforestation, it, it, it's, I don't, I don't think it can happen at all. So what do we do? The world governments, private sector have to move away from pushing for investments. They have to move away from um, promotion of gold as the, as, the, as, the, as the one that keeps the world moving. You know, we have to learn to start valuing um, environment and human life so that we can have a healthy world. I, I saw there was a, a poll from coming from the conference of what we would want to see uh, completing a, a, a survey of, you know, whether it's healthy or resilient forests. 
And the majority, I would say, sadly went for resilient. Resilient doesn't mean doesn't necessarily mean healthy. You know, so and that, that was my that was what I wanted to say. You know, there are so many, so many policies for resilient economies, resilient agriculture, resilient. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be healthy. So we really have to revisit as or as as a whole world how we how we push to protect our forests because we don't have another world. This is our home. Yes. Thanks, Laura. Vinamra. I think, yeah, I agree with Laura on, on most of this. And I think mining and um, no zero deforestation, I think is too big an ask of, of the current uh, way the world is uh, kind of uh, working with industries. And um, I think one way to look at it is kind of wherever there is extractive mining, especially in developing countries, I think the cost of restoration of these landscapes also has to be brought into the cost of the project uh, initially and kind of who pays for these damages and these companies can get to leave after 10 years with the zero restoration um, in some cases. So I think that is an important point to bring up, uh, especially to big companies uh, saying that uh, this is kind of not okay to continue as a practice, um, especially leading into the UN decade on restoration for 2021 to 2030. I think this will be an important uh, topic to talk about. And I think mostly, I, I think in Southeast Asia, there's still um, not as much mining within the landscapes I work, but as well, mostly extractive industry and timber being one of the top commodities currently, um, given this pandemic, I think um, that aspect of extractive industries is also not going to go away. So we can talk about certification, we can talk about restoration, and kind of bring in these mechanisms to um, contain some of these damages that, that is happening due to uh, mining and, and yeah, deforestation. Yes. Thank you for number. Pippa, please. Yeah, very quickly. Thanks. I know in the interest of time, we have to have no-go areas. You know, the bottom line is even the International Council for Mining Metals is calling for no-go areas. So we have to. And I think, Laura, your point around the health of ecosystems is fundamental. We need composition, structure and function to maintain the health and functionality of those systems. And these there are tipping points beyond which, you know, we cannot go. So we have to understand the values. We need to internalize all those externalities, you know, what it is costing beyond what has been, you know, calculated on some sort of spreadsheet around bankable feasibility and that sort of thing. Um, but we have to work together. And, and I mean, the, the point I was trying to make is that this is all linked to circularity. It's linked to consumer demand. We've got to demand less uh, in terms of the minerals. We've got to reuse a lot more, perhaps um, recycle much better. $63 billion worth of e-waste goes into landfills every year. We should be reusing those minerals. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very complex one, but we need to, yeah, we need to have no-go errands. Thank you, everybody. I think if you don't mind, if I can take off my moderator hat and just put on my 11 sources hat. And one of the things I understand is that we cannot transition to a green economy without minerals that are under forests right now. We cannot meet the demand for bauxite and nickel and zinc if we don't um, extract those minerals and recycling rates just aren't high enough and in some cases aren't feasible for certain minerals. So unfortunately, there are some really difficult trade-offs that we have to face and I completely agree with your point, Pippa, that materials efficiency is at the heart of how we can reduce impacts on forests. Now, Diego, if I can turn to you, um, with two questions. And then I think the second is something that others will want to respond to. Um, the first, a, a, a participant is asking about the situation in Ecuador um, and saying, you spoke only of artisanal mining, or let's be specific, you only spoke of illegal artisanal mining, um, and you didn't speak about large scale mining in Ecuador. Can you say something about the impacts of large scale mining on forests? Um, and maybe what some of the opportunities and challenges are there. Gracias, gracias por la pregunta. Um, 
Sí, eh, de verdad, el, en mi primera intervención me, me, me refería a lo que consideramos uno de los eh, retos más difíciles para el Estado ecuatoriano eh, respecto a lo que tiene que ver con la, la minería ilegal y la deforestación. Pero, lógicamente, ¿no? eh, eh, el Ecuador en, esta, en estos últimos años está entrando en, la, en esta fase y explorando lo que tiene que ver con la minería a gran escala. No lo hemos hecho en años anteriores, siempre hemos tenido una una minería artesanal y de pequeña escala, pero al entrar en esta nueva era, por así decirlo, de la, de la minería a gran escala, plantea muchísimos retos para el Estado, muchísimos retos para el Ministerio del Ambiente, y uno de ellos es lógicamente los procesos de restauración, los procesos de, re, de reforestación, que son clave en este, en, ese, en este sentido, y más porque los proyectos a gran escala que tenemos eh, ya funcionando en la actualidad en el país, están en zonas eh, cercanas a, a zonas sensibles y, y como no, en la, en, en la región amazónica de nuestro país. Eh, y eso, eh, me quiero referir a, a lo que mencionaba Estel, que, cuáles son los retos que eso, que eso representa para el Ecuador, y, y uno de ellos es el poder como Estado eh, establecer medidas específicas y que sean efectivas, sobre todo, para el, eh, los procesos de, de, de reforestación. Nuestro, los suelos de nuestra Amazonía tienen una calidad de pobre, si, si se quiere, en el sentido de que no es lo mismo hacer un proceso de reforestación en esas zonas como hacerlos en otras zonas del país, en zonas costeras, en zonas altoandinas. Entonces, eh, plantea ese reto y lo que hemos hecho, la estrategia principal que ha adoptado el... el eh, el Ministerio del Ambiente y Agua, es eh, hacer mucho más rigurosos los planes de manejo ambiental y específicamente los procesos de, de reforestación. Uh, por mencionarles solamente un ejemplo, rápidamente hay, una, hay eh, programas específicos donde se hacen rescate de flora nativa, la potenciación de esa, de esa flora y su posterior reinserción en las zonas que, en donde ha habido intervenciones. Todo este, todos estos esfuerzos sumado a, a, sumados a otros muchos, eh, por supuesto, se constituyen en procesos que nosotros, eh, nosotros controlamos y que las empresas, eh, al, ser, al ser empresas más grandes, tienen eh, equipos eh, de, de cuidado ambiental, de reforestación mucho más grandes en relación a los que tienen los, los, los mineros artesanales y de pequeña escala, que puede ser que no tengan esos equipos, pero la minería a gran escala, eh, y con esto, por favor, eh, no quiero entrar en la discusión de si es buena o mala, eh, creo que eso, es, eso corresponde a otro espacio, pero la realidad es que el país, el país en su, el, el país en su, en su totalidad, está, está abocado a, a, al desarrollo económico mucho más en esta situación post-COVID, post y que necesita eh, recursos económicos, etcétera. Y, y como les digo, hay, hay varias discusiones, hay, hay muchísimas preocupaciones que son legítimas, que son necesarias, que se inserten en la discusión nacional sobre um, cuál es el futuro que queremos darle a nuestra economía, si tiene que ser eh, a través de la explotación de recursos naturales o no, economías verdes, etcétera. Pero el, el, los esfuerzos que hemos hecho en, en este sentido han sido considerables, tenemos programas de monitoreo vastos en, en los dos, en, los, en la actualidad tenemos dos proyectos grandes de, de gran escala que están trabajando y que eh, estamos controlando, los tenemos equipos eh, básicamente dedicados al seguimiento de esos, de, esos, eh, de esos proyectos y que están eh, llevando los procesos, de, eh, como mencioné anteriormente, procesos de reforestación muy amplios. Eh, no solamente dentro de los proyectos mineros, es decir, dentro de los polígonos de, 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 de titularidad de, estos, de estas compañías, sino también en otros procesos que están haciendo fuera de ellos, que son una especie de compensación ambiental y social en, en, en este sentido, en las zonas de influencia. Muchas gracias, Diego. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move us to our last question, but I want to just gesture to a couple more audience questions that I wish we had time for. Um, one was about the relevance of human rights, but another was about the importance of participatory um, environmental monitoring committees as a structure and framework um, that can help um, with um, effective accountability of government action or inaction and um, infrastructure development. Um, so I do want to point that out as an important thing. 
um, to consider. Um, but our last question, and we need to be brief now, panelists, I'm so sorry, um, but we're running out of time. So it's going to be a brief one minute from each of you, perhaps starting with Pippa, if you don't mind, because I know that she is um, has a hard stop, is let's get to the guts of it. What do we really need to do now to realize goal three? What key transformations are necessary? What is needed from international instruments like the NYDF to accelerate and support national transformational efforts to reduce the negative impacts of mining and infrastructure sectors on forests and forest peoples? And Pippa, if you wouldn't mind going first, please. That's an enormous question. Thanks, Estelle. I, I think, honestly, we, we just need all hands to, uh, hands to the deck. We have to have, you know, good, strong, strong policy. We need um, collective action demanding uh, much better performance from our the companies and governments to make sure they're implementing their laws and companies are practicing uh, best practice. We have to have areas that cannot be mined in and or can, you know, that are just essentially protected for their biodiversity, ecosystem service and climate uh, mitigation values. And we need to use uh, as far as possible nature-based solutions that will enable in this decade of restoration um, the, the, the protection and, and, and restoration of some of the degraded forest systems that we have. So, you know, we cannot allow further degradation and further loss. We have to maintain and, and bend, bend that curve towards that, that recovery that we have as a target for the post-2020 agenda by 2050. We need biodiversity and forest systems to be recovered. That's a big, big target. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pippa. Um, who would like to go next? I'll go next, uh, Stel. So in supporting Pippa's um, points as well, I want to add that governments need to enhance their transparency um, and access to public information and strengthen civil society. And mm -hmm. so that across the board, we are able to hold governments, companies, and you know whatever extractive uh, sectors accountable. That, that is what we need to have. Um, we need to, for example, in Guyana, reform our, our EPA or EPA Act and the ESIA um, processes that indigenous peoples and civil society are able to participate. That, that is what we would like to have. Thank you very much, Laura. Diego Benamra. Yeah, I think just caught top three points to make. I think here, I think everybody said it. I think everybody knows it. And it's just improving accountability measures for everybody. So just be accountable and be uh, kind of fair on the landscapes that you're working in and create more locally based solutions. Uh, as well as um, just integrate the voices of the indigenous um, people who live in these landscapes and probably have been conserving them and managing them uh, much better for a longer duration of time. And I think uh, from a youth for nature point of view, I think youth has the advantage of innovating um, in these pathways, both for forest and the people, which the goal states uh, without ignoring the development progress. Um, so yeah, I think those would be the takeaway points to kind of improve um, and what is needed. Thank you, Vinamra. Diego. Thank you, Stel. I'm gonna do this part in English, I'm sorry, in honor to the time. Uh, uh, yes, yes. But the main, the main core of, the, of this situation for, for the Ministry of Environment and Water is uh, focusing all, this, all the efforts in um, developing new techniques, uh, as long as new regulations to improve our, our own processes of uh, restoration or rest, uh, reforestation processes. Because um, in the case of Ecuador, we have a lot of uh, scenarios in our country, within our country. So we have to adapt all kinds of technologies, all kinds of um, messengers, all kind of uh, regulations around these uh, these topics, and uh, as well, we need um, as much as uh, uh, sources uh, or discussions around these uh, these techniques to improve them by by themselves. So um, the main the main thing uh, around all all this uh, all this situation is the, um, we need a lot of opinions 
a lot of sources, a lot of, and of course, the indigenous uh, opinions are really important for us. So we need to um, collect all these all these uh, factors and um, make a big, big, big whole, um, a, a big regulation that is inclusive and and is looking and trying to make them um, look to the future. So we can afford all uh, the majority of the topics. Thank you, Diego. So what I'm really hearing is the importance of accountability frameworks, inclusion, a joined up approach, um, and really a recognition of rights as being at the heart of achieving uh, the NYDF. I'm going to move to close the session. Um, and I want to do so by firstly thanking um, all of the panelists um, for your um, very interesting interventions. Thanking Trevor, the technical team, and Maddie and Jimena, uh, who are in the background, um, and the rest of the team at Climate Focus and the Meridian Institute of New York Declaration of Forests. And lastly, to thank Erin um, for the hard work she's done on the assessment. And I really do encourage all of you to look out for the report. I think the very last thing I want to say is that it's not up to everybody else to help protect forests in the face of extractives and infrastructure. We all have a role to play. Um, and I particularly want to invite mining companies or representatives of mining companies who might be listening to raise this internally in your companies as a subject that your organization might want to give some attention to. Because with the UN Decade of Restoration coming up with the latest information on biodiversity and indigenous rights and the murders of environmental defenders, we need private sector champions um, to join this community of practitioners who are fighting to protect forests. Um, so if you're interested, get in touch with me, get in touch with Erin or any of the panelists and we will help pull you into this process and we welcome you with open arms. And uh, thanks to all of you in the audience for your wonderful questions and for joining us on this very important topic. Bye-bye.